So it's my pleasure to introduce one of the world experts in diagnostic testing, Patrick Bethoit. Thank you very much for the uh, pleasure for being back in Oxford and the honor of presenting to you some of my work. Um, it's a top act to follow, actually, these words, <laughs> and Peter Gutscher. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, to follow up this title, which was given to me by the organizers. And usually, I'm not very provocative. Uh, I found this title provocative, and I'm trying to present arguments why medical testing could be the next frontier of evidence-based medicine. <coughs> And I want to tell the story, actually, in a, in a somewhat personal way. Um, and for that story, we have to go to continental Europe. Um, I grew up in Belgium. I grew up in Antwerp. I studied in Ghent. And then I wanted to do an international PhD, so I moved to the Netherlands. And in Nijmegen, I met my wife. And with my wife, I then moved to Rotterdam, where I had my first academic uh, position. And you may think of Rotterdam as a city that was bombed in the May 1940 by the Germans and completely devastated. Actually, the, all the old buildings are uh, gone. But it also actually has been rebuilt very nicely, and it has a, a very interesting medical center, academic medical center, where I had my first academic position. So my wife and I thought that the time was right for building a family. And after a few months, our first son was born, uh, Stein, you can see on, on this picture. And then we didn't believe in single child families, so with some luck, and 20 months later, our next son was born, Daniel, also in very good health, uh, like his brother. My wife and I decided to go on for a third child, uh, but with less luck than in the previous attempt. So my wife had at some time a miscarriage, and then, after a couple of months, another miscarriage. And to the males in the audience, I can tell you that it may not sound like the end of the world, but it's a pretty stressing, actually, affair. It comes with feeling of uh, emotional discomfort, with distress, uh, feelings of depression, of personal failure. And we went to see our midwife, who had delivered the first two boys, and discuss the situation. And the midwife said, well, you had one miscarriage, and you had a second miscarriage. Uh, that's a clinical condition. We call that repeated or recurrent miscarriage. And I would recommend you to undergo a medical test, which we usually do in this condition, which is karyotyping. Now, I don't know if you remember what karyotyping is, uh, but it's basically that we should, would be referred to the genetics lab of the medical center where I was working, uh, this Erasmus Medical Center. And there we would, actually, they would map out the chromosomes, both of myself and of my wife. So they would stain the chromosomes, arrange them nicely in pairs, and look for abnormalities. And the midwife explained to us that this test would set us back about 1,000 euros, uh, but it would probably be covered by insurance. We thought about the uh, attractive prospect of having our chromosomes mapped out, both of us, and discussed the situation for a while, and then decided not to undergo parental karyotyping. So neither my wife and myself, actually, we did not go to the genetics lab. And we did, uh, <clears throat> decided not to undergo the test. And with a little bit of luck, a couple of months later, our third son was born, also in very good, very good health. So I'm now the proud parent of these three healthy boys. After a while, the department where I was working in the Erasmus Medical Center actually stopped existing. It was dismantled, funding was stopped. Why? That's another story. You can ask me over coffee. Uh, it's a matter of cardiology and uh, Swiss bank accounts and uh, all of that. <laughs> so I had to look for another position, and I moved to Amsterdam. I moved to the hospital that was slightly south of Amsterdam, the Academic Medical Center. And the Academic Medical Center had just started the Department of Clinical Epidemiology. And there, throughout the years, actually, I 
was invited to work again on karyotyping by the fertility specialist and the professor of genetics, pure by coincidence. Because most of the time, actually, I work in my department, academic medical center on trials of um, new therapies, not just medical tests, with very different specialties. So I'm no fertility expert. But after years, I actually was invited to look at karyotyping, but now from the paradigm of evidence-based medical testing. This is the inside of my current hospital. They started the Department of Clinical Epidemiology because they wanted to respond to the invitations, uh, the uh, challenges about assessment and accountability in uh, modern healthcare. And the hospital prouds itself of having introduced evidence-based medicine to the Netherlands. So you can see here the textbook on evidence-based medicine in Dutch. And the book that was uh, presented when the dean retired, and it compares evidence-based medicine to skating on thick ice. Anyway, so let's see what evidence-based medicine tells us about karyotyping. And let's first go to the Bible of the evidence-based medicine, to the Cochrane Library. If we enter karyotyping in the Cochrane Library, we found one review. But that review is only about communication strategies for disclosing results of diagnostic prenatal testing. And that's something very different. There's no systematic review about parental karyotyping. Well, don't worry, be happy. Um, I'm a clinical epidemiologist, so I turn to my textbooks on clinical epidemiology, my two Bibles, from these two godfathers of uh, evidence-based medicine, clinical epidemiology, Alvin Feinstein and Dave Sackett. And in these textbooks and many others, actually, there's usually a chapter about diagnosis, the only one that discusses medical tests, usually. And that chapter talks about diagnostic accuracy. How good is the test in correctly classifying patients as being diseased? And we learn there that we do such studies by comparing medical tests with a gold standard, but in many cases there isn't a gold standard, so we have to do with the clinical reference standard, the best available tests, and in the diagnostic accuracy, we take a series of patients, all submit them to the test under evaluation, then to the reference standard, and we compare the results. And from these two by two tables, for example, in this case, breast cancer recurrence, we can calculate sensitivity and the specificity of the test, and we can calculate predictive and negative, positive and negative predictive values, likelihood ratios and odds ratios. It's all very challenging, and each year, we have to try and test medical students who have to learn by heart these concepts. And it's no coincidence, actually, that Dave Sackett, in his clinical epidemiology book, with his colleagues, describes mastering these two-by-two -two tables as the art of judo, where you can move from brown belt to orange belt to brown belt to black belt. So very difficult concepts. OK, let's see if we can find any diagnostic accuracy studies about parental karyotyping. So I go to the clinical queries in PubMed, enter uh, karyotyping and miscarriage, and I find a number of studies. For example, this one, it's a comparison about new techniques for parental karyotyping. And God beware, actually, these new techniques, they are compared against actually cytogenetic karyotyping, which is the clinical reference standard in this comparison of the novel techniques with the existing techniques. So what did I do at the time? I had refused to undergo the gold standard for parental karyotyping, which was cytogenetic karyotyping. So what did I, did I do wrong something? Had I done something wrong by refusing to undergo parental karyotyping? Hmm. Let's see and what these studies that I have been invited to tell us. Should I have undergone parental karyotyping at the time? Well, with colleagues, we did this study, which was published in the BMJ a while ago, where we looked at the chances of having a positive result with parental karyotyping. And it turns out that in actually that with, sorry, it's not this, that's not our study, it's a different study, that explains actually some of the background behind actually miscarriage and spontaneous abortions. And as you can See, in this slide, the risk of spontaneous abortions increases with maternal age. The older you get, actually, the higher the risk of a miscarriage or a spontaneous abortion for the female. And about 50% of these miscarriages and spontaneous abortions are attributed to chromosomal abnormalities. 
And these, uh, <clears throat> the risk of a miscarriage or an abortion is higher if you had already a number of episodes of miscarriage in the, in the past. So in the 1980s, several people have done st did studies in couples with two or more abortions, and they found out that some of the parents actually, actually had a chromosomal abnormality themselves. So it's not just the fetus, actually, but the parents were carrying a chromosomal abnormality. So these authors and others concluded that couples should have chromosome studies after two abortions, and that maternal mosaicism occurs as frequently as a balanced parental translocation. So that means that there are parents out, actually healthy people out, actually, who have a, actually are healthy themselves, but could pass on chromosomal abnormalities onto their children, and that ex would explain the recurrent miscarriage. And many of these abnormalities are numerical abnormalities, but there also are unbalanced structural abnormalities. So that means many of them are translocations. You can have balanced and unbalanced translocations. And that's the background. So it's estimated that between 4 and 10% of the parents, actually, where the wife has experienced a miscarriage, have such a chromosomal abnormality. And that was the reason why we were invited to undergo parental karyotyping. And here you see actually a karyotype in which there is a trisomy 21, actually, which is uh, associated with Down syndrome. So should we have undergone karyotyping? Had I been wrong in my, uh, my decision? Well, this is a study that I referred to earlier. It's a study that was done in Amsterdam with my colleagues from the fertility department at the genetics department, in which we did a case control study to document the risk of having a positive result in parental karyotyping. And what we did is that we went back to people that had been identified in parental karyotyping as carriers of a structural abnormality, and we compared them with non-carriers. And we looked at factors associated with carriership. So what factors are associated with testing positive, so to speak, on parental karyotyping? And by comparing uh, carriers and non-carriers, we found out actually that age was very strongly associated with actually carriership. So if you're relatively young and have repeated miscarriage, actually you have a high risk, actually as a parent or a future parent, for, ca for uh, uh, carrying a structural abnormality. It also increases if there's a familial association. If there are, have been more miscarriages with your parents, your risk increases as well, or a brother or a sister. But in our case, actually, my wife was completely healthy. There had been no history of miscarriages in my uh, family, nor in the family of my wife. And my wife was already 35 when we wished to have our third child. So if we use these results to calculate our own risk, actually the risk of testing positive was less than 1%. So we were to pay 1,000 euros with a 1 in 100 chances of testing positive in parental karyotyping. Okay, that's all fair, but maybe actually the risk of carrying a structural abnormality are extremely high. And that maybe would justify testing, even with a 1 in 100 percent of testing positive. What really matters is not just testing positive or not, or having the information, but the consequences. My wife and I, we must admit, were worried about the outcome of the next pregnancy. So is structural abnormality is a, is a chromosomal abnormality in the parents associated with poor maternal outcome? And also an important question, if it is, is there something you can do about it? So we did our next study uh, with the colleagues in Amsterdam, also published in BMJ, and we looked at reproductive outcome after chromosome analysis in couples with two or more miscarriages. And it was called a case control study. Uh, that was a mistake by the BMJ. It's not a case control study. It's a mistake by the editor. It's an index control study because we were comparing carriers and non-carriers and looking at reproductive outcome. So we had carrier couples, uh, almost 300, and 400 non-carrier couples. And we all went back, actually, and documented how many actually tried to achieve another pregnancy and what the outcome of these pregnancies were. And here are the results from that study. So, in terms of failure to conceive, 
there was not a marked difference between the two groups. There was a difference in the number of miscarriages. So people, carriers of a structural abnormality, had more miscarriages in the next pregnancy than non-carriers, uh, which is actually according to the book. But there's not much you can do about this. What about the reproduct reproductive outcome of term pregnancies? Well, in the end, carriers had as many healthy babies as non-carriers. So testing positive was not associated with having fewer healthy children. And even if it had been in case of a healthy mother, actually with no other health conditions, there's little you can do to correct the structural abnormality other than prenatal testing. So <clears throat> we had, so parental karyotyping in our case had a very low chance of getting a positive result. And even in case of a positive result, actually, there was a very low risk of not having a healthy child afterwards. So my decision at the time was based more or less on my own work because I was working in a department for medical decision making where we were trained to look at the consequences about what we were doing and not just at the test results itself. So I've taken that knowledge about looking at the consequences to the academic medical center in Amsterdam where I'm now I'm working. There's one more study that I want to discuss with you this morning and that's a study that was published a, a while ago in which one of our PhD students went back to the parents that had undergone parental karyotyping. And all these parents had been counseled by the geneticist in, our, in my own hospital. And then our PhD student invited these patients to respond to simple questions like, do you think this is a genetic test or not? What do you think the consequences are of testing positive? And I was personally amazed, actually, by, struck by the fact that very few people undergoing parental caretaking were able to reproduce why they were referred for testing and what the consequences of the test result were be, despite being counseled by a geneticist and an academic medical center. So there's something to be done there. Now, what does this story tells us about medical tests in general? Well, I believe that there are two views on the value of medical tests. And there's an essentialist view and a consequentialist view. And the essentialist view says that the value of a marker or a medical test can be judged and should be judged by the trueness of its result. So it's the information in the test that is valuable. And if the information is correct, the test should be valuable. But I believe that we all should be consequentialists that the value of a marker or a medical test in general should be judged by the value of the consequences. We should look at the harms and benefits of testing, not just at the trueness of the results itself. And if you contrast these views, as I have done last year in my presentation, you find that essentialists uh, emphasize the truth and the information in the test result, whereas consequentialists look at the utility and the health outcome. And I believe gradually that society and we all should move from an essentialist view to a consequentialist view, that we should emphasize consequences. And what Peter did talking about screening is, what, is exactly this. He was looking at the consequences of screening. We do it for screening, we should do it for all forms of medical testing. So it is a kind of a sad story that clinical epidemiology looks at diagnosis essentially in an essentialist way. We emphasize actually the two by two table, and we emphasize the correctness of the diagnosis by learning people the tricks of sensitivity and specificity. And one of the godfathers of clinical epidemiology, Albert Feinstein, his very last paper, last paper, lamented actually this direction that clinical epidemiology was going. And he was talking about misguided efforts and future challenges for research on diagnostic tests in 202. So, it's true, medical tests are not just used for making a diagnosis. So looking at a two-by-two two table for diagnostic tests obscures the fact that we now have medical tests everywhere in healthcare. And for every purpose of medical testing, we should look at the consequences, at the harms and benefits of testing, and instruct professionals, patients, and other decision makers about the value of testing based on comparing the harms and benefits. 
So I hope that future books about evidence-based medicine and future courses about evidence-based medicine should take, will take this consequentialist view. So I think that in the future, medical tests in evidence-based medicine should be treated like other interventions. We invite people to think about the consequences of, of treatments, the consequences of pharmaceuticals, comparing harms and benefits. Well, we should do the same for all forms of medical testing. And we should also evaluate them like other interventions, not be essentialists and focusing on the information itself, but looking at the consequences. And that would invite, how we should do that, that would invite a longer presentation. And I'm sure that in the diagnosis session this afternoon, some of the speakers will explain how we should collect, synthesize, and translate the evidence about the harms and benefits of medical testing. And in the end, let's stop teaching Bayes' theorem to those actually going to evidence-based medicine courses. I think Bayes' theorem should be part of anyone's education, actually, to learn about common mistakes in thinking as a course in psychology, and maybe as an introduction in statistics. But do not train people in Bayes' theorem if you want to learn, about, if we want to actually train them in evidence-based medical testing. I think it's a mistake. So here are my three boys. I'm very happy with them. Stan is now 23, Daniel 21, and Thomas is now 18. Stan wants to go to medical school, but the Dutch lottery system failed him three times, and he's out. Daniel is studying political sciences, and Thomas hopes to go to medical school next year. I hope they will arrive in a healthcare system, actually, that evaluates medical tests just as thoroughly as other interventions, and evaluates medical tests on their consequences, not just on the information it carries. Thank you very much for your attention.